There we go. Okay, we are doing 52 weeks with Jesus. We are on part 28, which is entitled The Grace Giver. Um, comes from Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read that. If you got a Bible and want to read along or look along on your app or whatever you do, however you read your Bible. Quite a bit of scripture here uh, for this one. Uh, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, a very familiar uh, parable, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Then we're going to dive right in. Got a couple of thoughts I'd like to add to what the author has in the book here. And we'll go uh, from there. So starting in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, says, and he said, and he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided into them his living. Sorry, I'm going to move it up. I can't see that far. My eyesight's getting worse. Uh, verse 13, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all there, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, uh, I remember the night I came to myself, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish, perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat it and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder brother was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. So I'm about the other brother, the brother that didn't go off. Um, he was angry and would not come in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou gavest me, never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast for him the fatted calf, hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. <clears throat> so that's our main scripture. Uh, very familiar um, parable known as the prodigal son. Something we'll get to here in a minute is the fact that it, nowhere in the Bible does it actually say prodigal. It doesn't say the prodigal son. Uh, but let's get into it. Okay, it says a modern parable. <clears throat> in a small suburban town lived a man with a su successful hardware store. His two sons worked there. The older one served as the back office accountant while the younger managed the place. One day, the younger son told the father that he wanted out. The father was confused and reluctant, but he walked to the back of the office, opened the safe, and handed him half of the money that was stored inside. The son stuffed the cash in his bag and was gone to crash with a friend and spend his dad's money on food, drink, and drugs. When the money ran low, he eventually sold his grandfather's old car that his dad had given him after he graduated. 
Before he knew it, he was living on the street, earning cash selling goods he had stolen from local stores. Hungry, desperate, spirit broken, he finally decided to return home. Even the part-timers at my dad's store have more than I do, he thought. I'll beg him to let me stock the shelves. He thumbed a ride back home and walked in the front door of the store. When his dad saw him, he bolted through the store, knocking over a display and wrapped his son in his arms, weeping. The store was full of customers, but the father didn't care if, it made, uh, if he made a fool of himself. He was just happy that his son was home. Looking on, the older brother, ticked off that his dad received his wayward son, couldn't wrap his mind around his dad's reaction. And I think that's one <clears throat> that gets missed a lot when you read or, or talk about this parable of the prodigal son, everybody looks at the son. This one looks at it from a different angle. This this uh, Bible study looks at it from the aspect of the father, but there's also the second son. And um, I think all too often I fall into the category, uh, and it's not a good thing, but I fall into the category of the second son of why is this one doing good? Why, God, are you blessing that? Why, uh, God, I've tried, and, and, and we tend to do this sometimes. I've tried my best to live uh, the way that I'm supposed to, and I haven't done this, and I haven't done that. And, uh, I haven't lived like the, the other son that went off and took everything and wasted it and uh, made a waste of his life, but his life was important too, and the father was just glad to see him back home. But we're too often, we'll fall, if we're not careful, into the role of that second son who thinks, why not me? Uh, why couldn't I be the one getting that? He even said there, you never gave me a calf to kill and have a party with my friends. And I've been here the whole time. Uh, but that's not the, the spirit we should have. We should be like the father uh, and be thankful that the son has come back home. It says two groups. You may recognize the retelling of the, of the parable of the prodigal son, although that's not a good name for it. Not even Jesus called it that. He begins a story in Luke 15, 11 with, there was a man who had two sons. And that kind of struck me. I never noticed it. I mean, the, the whole parable, I've heard it all my life as uh, the parable of the prodigal son and the word prodigal is not even in there. So I actually looked that up and prodigal is a noun. And uh, in the definition, it says it's a person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. And um, it, it fits the description, but that's not, actually what it's called but if you think about it uh when we're away from god when we were lost we all maybe not money but lived in a recklessly extravagant way to please flesh instead of the father uh the book goes on to say there are two brothers and they represent every person in the world who is separated from god two groups of people had come to listen to jesus that day and each one is represented by one of the two sons there are the bad guys, the tax collectors, and the sinners. Then you have the good guys, the Pharisees. They were the churchgoers. They were the fundamentalists. They were full of judgment and empty of mercy. One group was so bad, they didn't think they could ever, that God would ever accept them. The other group was so good, they thought God had already accepted them, but both groups were wrong. Uh, we have to be careful uh, as Christians to think that we've ever earned anything. Uh, my Bible says that salvation is the gift of God. Uh, I'm never good enough to deserve it, no matter what I do. I could do this Bible study uh, every day of the week on Facebook, um, and that really don't mean anything if my heart's not right with God. Uh, you can never be good enough to earn his grace and mercy. Uh, just like on the other side, talking about the other group, you can never be so far away that God's not reaching out in love trying to call you back home. Where were we? Um, Jesus tells a parable to show how God sees both groups. We always tend to focus on the son who comes back home, but Jesus' focus is on the father. The father and his relationship are the central teachings of this parable. What we discover about him is that the father's door is always open and the Father's message is always welcome. Uh, and I wrote here in the margins, no matter what you've done, God's arms are always open for repentance. And uh, it's true repentance. I kind of 
struggle with this section for just a second um, to wrap my mind around it, how I think it says that the Father's door is always open and the Father's message is always welcome. And yes, God is always welcoming, trying to draw that sinner in, but there has to be a change. Okay, when the son came back home, uh, the story ends here. But when the son came back home, I don't picture the son as going in and crashing on the couch and doing no work and being lazy and being so. There was a change. The son had a change, it says here in verse uh, chapter 15 and verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, when he came to the knowledge of what he had done and how he had wasted what the father had gave him, or in terms of me and you, let's, let's take it out of the prodigal son um, parable and into the us parable. When we came to the knowledge that we were a sinner, lost, and in need of a savior, there was a change that was made. You don't just come to God and say, okay, God, I'm ready to go to heaven, but now I'm going to go back out and I'm going to continue to play with the swine out here in the field. There has to be that change. So yes, Jesus or, or God is always welcoming with an open door, um, but there has to be a change. Without a change, what is it? It's nothing. Um, and I also... This is personal to me. I want to stress this is just my personal opinion. Uh, I have the problem with the Father's door is always open. The Father's door is always open as long as he's called. If you wait and the Spirit is not drawing you to the Lord, you can't just wake up one day and say, I think today's the day I'm going to quit doing all this other stuff. I'm going to get saved today. It don't work that way. The Spirit has to be drawing you. And just like it says over there, when um, uh, Noah preached for years, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, and they listened and they listened and they listened. And then it says that they entered into the ship and God shut the door. And it says that also, it says that I believe uh, about the 10 virgins, uh, that when the five wise went into the marriage, the door was shut. There is going to be a point in time when the door to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior is going to be shut. So Please, while the drawing is on your heart, while God is saying, welcome, come in, come in to me, come in, come in, come back to the Father, uh, now's the time to do it because there will come a time when every knee will bow, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, but don't wait until it's too late. He says, depart from man ever knew you. Uh, so that's, that's my opinion that I wanted to add into that part where it says the Father's door is always open and the Father's message is always welcome. Uh, the next part says the, Father's love, the Father loves us when we rebel against him. The story uh, with a son who evidently, the story begins with a son who evidently had everything in life you could ever want, but somehow the root of ingratitude had bloomed into the fruit of rebellion. The Jewish law was clear. In this case, the older son would get two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son would get one-third. There was only one catch. The father needed to be dead. If the younger son was saying to his father, it was as if the younger son was saying to his father, I wish you were dead. So to go, in that time to go and request your inheritance, it's like the younger son was coming to his dad with disgust and hate and and anger and angst and all these things built up in him and, and basically telling his dad, you know, I just wish you would die so I could have what's mine. And the father gave it to him. If you're a parent, can you imagine hearing anything more devastating from your children? This son dishonored, disgraced, and disowned his father. And I have put a note here, wonder how many times God looks down on the choices we make in life uh, and I'm going to speak to the saved, born again, washed in the blood Christians right now. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. So let me put that out there. How many times does God look down on what I'm doing or how I'm conducting my life or how I am taking the opportunities 
uh, that God's given me, the doors he's opened for me. Uh, and, and I believe we do this. God opens the door, and instead of going through, we shut the door. God, I don't want to go through that door. We shut it. I'd rather go through that when it's closed over there. How many times by not doing what the Lord's put on our heart, do we dishonor, disgrace, and even sometimes uh, disown? And you say, well, I've never disowned God. Uh, are you any better than Peter? Jesus told Peter, uh, basically on this rock, talking about him, on, on you, the church, the new church, uh, after I'm gone, is going to spread out. We're going to build the church through you, Peter. But you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. How many times have we disowned God in the way we've acted or in the things we've allowed in our life or the things we've gone along with? How many times have we dishonored God by not doing what he would have us to do? We're asking for things that we know we don't need or don't. It's not the right thing to be asking for or, or disgrace God by the way we've responded or acted in life. <clears throat> a typical father in that day, this is talking about back to where it said, um, basically the, the younger son pretty much told his dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance. Give me what's mine. Die. Leave me alone. I, I want no part of this family anymore. Give me what's mine. I'm going to go do what I want to. A typical father in that day would have slapped his son across the face, kicked him out of the house, and disowned him in front of the entire community. But not only does the father ignore the insult, he does the unthinkable by granting the son's wish. And I, it made me think of our prayers and sometimes, um, wow, just country song, that songs come to my head, weird ones at times, but there's that song that says, um, I thank God for unanswered prayers. And that's true. There's things I've prayed that I'm glad God didn't answer. But um, I put a note in here also to be careful what you ask for, because sometimes God just might give it to you. Um, I've always heard, be careful praying for patience, so because God just might give you what it takes to build those patience, and then do you really want it? Uh, sometimes we get exactly what we ask for. So we have to be careful how we ask. The Bible says in one place, you have not because you ask amiss. Uh, are we asking for the right things and for the right reasons and the right ways? Or are we asking from a fleshly, selfish point of view? At first, everything goes as planned for this boy. He bought the beachfront condo, drove the Ferrari, had a Rolex on his wrist, and a different woman in his bed every night. He just This is the, the writer's way of saying the, the prodigal son had everything he wanted to begin with. Because we know the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Okay, Then he blew it. He lost it all. The boy lost everything except his father's love. And that made me think, and I want to read, I marked here uh, some couple of different passages. Uh, first, I was going to read from Romans 8. If I can find my spot. 8, verses 38 and 39. I thought, it says the boy lost everything except his father's love. Uh, we can give up on God. Uh, but God will never give up on us. He will love us. Uh, we may turn him away all the way to the point of we die and go to hell, but that does not mean that God does not love us. And over here I find in Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can take God's love away from us. We can walk away from God's love and take the, the consequences that come along with that, the physical consequences of maybe we have to go through um, struggles here um, in this life for walking away from the love of God or, or the ultimate of of, of dying without that salvation and going to hell, but that does not change. God loves the ugliest, nastiest sinner just as much as he loves the most holy, righteous, at the foot of the cross person. There's nothing that can make God not love you. Now, we can choose not to accept that love. 
that's where God's gave us the free will to make that choice. But we can't make God not love us. Let me see. Everyone, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you've done, has a father who loves them. There is no limit to how far he will let you go, but there is also no limit to how long he will wait for you to return. And I wanted to add to that one, <clears throat> and this is a, one of my favorite scriptures over here, and I'm just going to read one of them. Uh, there's a little section here, but it's in Romans chapter 5. And I thought if you looked in, if I made my own version of a dictionary, and I took words or phrases and put in there, and in this dictionary, I could go through scripture and define a word by a verse. This would be the easiest one <clears throat> for me to define. First one I would put is the term unconditional love. What is unconditional love? And it is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's To me, that is the definition of unconditional love. When we didn't love him, even though we were sinners, even though we were adulterers, murderers, uh, backbiters, whoremongers, all these things that's listed in the Bible that says these shall not inherit the kingdom of God, even though it says that, God loved us enough that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Whether we choose him or not, he did it. It's up to us to choose it, but we can say, I want no part of that, but he loved us enough that he gave us the ultimate trump card, I guess, is, is one way to look at it. So to me, Romans 5 and 8, that, that is the definition of unconditional love. It says here, this is, oh, next to last section. I thought this was the last. The Father accepts us when we return to him. The poet Robert Frost famously said, Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Just like a pigeon, the homing instinct had kicked in on this kid and he wanted to go home. There's one door that is always open, and that is the door to the Father's house. You can never run so far that God won't take you back. But then again, it comes back to the, I don't, I don't, want, I don't ever want to confuse anybody by making you believe that you can go out and live however you want to and do whatever you want to. And God is just standing there with the door open saying, it's okay, just come in. Uh, he wants you to come in, it is. But there has to be a change. There has to be repentance there. And I never want to lead anybody the wrong way to think you can live however you want to and be accepted by God because that is 100% counter uh, to what the Bible says, counter to his word. You can't live any way you want to and come into God's house, come into God's family, live in any way you want to. It, it don't work that way. I never want... That's why I struggle with this book sometimes. I don't think that's where he's going, but I never want to leave any gray area there for anybody to think that I can do however I want, live however I want, and God loves me so much that I can do whatever I want down here on earth, and when I get to heaven, he's going to say, well, yeah, I love you so much. Come on in. It don't work that way. That's not the truth. The son who had strutted out the front door is now slinking up the dirt road and his father is setting a record for the 100-yard dash to get to his boy. Ancient Hebrew culture considered running to be an undignified act for an older man. Men wore long flowing robes and tunics and they would have to gather up, gather all these up under their waist to run and would expose their undergarments. But love doesn't care what other people think. And I think we need to get beyond that, too, as a church. Love for the, for the lost shouldn't care what other people think. If God tells me to, you know, take this shirt off and go outside and give it to the homeless man or something, um, I shouldn't think, well, everybody's going to laugh at me because there I am shirtless and, you know, I'm fat and 
hairy and look like a gorilla without a shirt on. Um, love shouldn't worry about what other people think. Love is, I want to say love is love. That's just kind of a roundabout way of saying nothing. But, but love, true, godly, unconditional love doesn't care how it makes you. It's not about self. Let's put it that way. Uh, if it makes self look bad, oh well. It's all about God, and 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 sharing His love with others. This is how our heavenly Father treats everyone who decides to come home. He sees us with the eyes of forgiveness. And then finally, it says the Father pursues us when we reject Him. Just what I said. We can reject God, but that doesn't mean that God says, "I don't love you anymore." Okay, I want to get down that path again. Um, the older son is so angry, he takes the radical step of breaking his relationship with his father. For a son to refuse to go into any party or banquet a father hosted was an unspeakable public insult. Neither son wanted to be at this party. The younger son was embarrassed because he didn't think he deserved the party. The older son was angry because he thought he did deserve, deserve it being him, not the younger, but him himself deserved it. The real problem with the older brother, though, was that he compared himself to someone he had deemed unrighteous. And it's not our place to deem anybody unrighteous. So let's just move on. Do you know why a lot of younger brothers are still out there in the pig pen and don't want to come into the church? They see a church full of older brothers who don't want them to come in the church and are afraid if they do come, they will be slapped with the cold hand of judgment rather than touched with the warm hand of love. And I see that as the cold and indifferent church who doesn't want to see. Our goal as a church should be to bring in the lost and see them get saved. Uh, but it's saying here, um, the 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 one that we quote unquote the the unworthy uh, to come in 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 man's eyes we tend to shun away sometimes as a church because we're afraid it's going to bring conviction on ourselves and uh, show something on ourself and we're going to have to deal with self and we're too many times like the Pharisees all high and mighty. And think that we don't need the altar. We're the, we're the church. We're saved. Why do we need an altar? Uh, what what have we done wrong? But that's not the case. It's not what this is all about. There's it's just like love doesn't care what other people think. We as a church, or we as as a, as a safe person, me, I don't care what other people think about me, and I shouldn't care. Sometimes I do. I think we're all guilty of it. Sometimes. You know, we worry about how other people look at us or think of us, but we need to, God's number one, everything else is below God. And if it makes us look like a fool for God, look like a fool for God. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, Self-righteous people think that unrighteous people can never be forgiven and should never be forgiven. But while the older brother is into punishment, the father is into pardon. The older brother is into guilt, but the father is into grace. The older brother is into revenge, but the father is into reconciliation. No matter how far you've wandered, no matter how low you've sunk, know that upon your return, you will find the father in front of an open door with arms, with open arms and a loving heart. If you've walked away, if you've, maybe you've been there <clears throat> right at the foot of the cross. Maybe you've been right where God wants you to be and have walked away. Remember that God is right there where you left him. Um, I'm not good with directions, but I, I know uh, I used to run, believe it or not, till I got fat. I used to run, and up at Nafalula Falls, they have these uh, dirt trails, and it's easy to get lost. Uh, they've added even more since the last time I went up there, these, these hiking trails and things, and it's, you don't know what you're doing it's easy to get lost and get turned around but the best way if you go down a trail and you get lost you don't know where you're headed the best way to get out of it is to turn around and go back to where you came from and that's what 
I believe it's saying there is if, if you've walked away from God, if you're not where you used to be, maybe maybe you're still, you're going to church, you're, but you're just not feeling it. Uh, that closeness, you want to be closer. You can be just as close as you want to be to God, but you've got to come back to him. He's not going to drag you back. He's not going to force you. You're not on a leash. We walk our dog on the road, and I got that little button. You can hit the button, and it, that leash will only go so far, and you can retract it back. God, God's not going to do that to you. But if you're not where you need to be, you can always turn and go back to where you left them. Uh, question. What are the ways in which what are the ways in which you, like the older brother, have refused to extend grace you perceived? That's a that's a kind of a loaded question there, because I know there's times uh, God's gave grace and mercy to me, and I failed to extend grace that same grace and mercy to others. But that's part 28, the grace giver. So if you're still with me here, and um, we're getting closer to the end, 52, 52 minus 28, you'll know how many more of these there are. I'm not good at math. I went to Oaks Bluff. Uh, nothing against teachers or Oaks Bluff teachers, but we, we don't do good at math, or at least I don't. Uh, next time we will do part 29, and it is entitled Discerner of the Heart. And Discerner of the Heart, part 29. If you're reading the scriptures at home before we get into the study, the main scripture for next time comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30. Now some other scriptures that kind of go along and it touches on in here. Uh, will be 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. And then 1 John chapter 2. Verses 18 through 23. We'll do that one next time. The discerner of the heart. I've enjoyed these. Um, there's days that this is what I long for, look for, um, what gets me through uh, to my next day. So hope you've enjoyed them, and we'll look to see you next time.